Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome once again to a Golden Shovel Expert webinar series. We have a really exciting presentation today for February. Uh, they were going to be introducing uh, Lacey Beasley, President and CEO, COO of Retail Strategies. Um, Lacey has been involved in retail since, since uh, 2005. Her experience with the Shopping Center Group and the Dickinson County Chamber of Commerce prior to joining Retail Strategies provides her with the insight to understand the connections needed from the public and private side of the conversation. A graduate of Lipscomb University, she earned her double major in marketing and management. Uh, Lacey, thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you allowing me to be a part of a great webinar and, and just really applaud Golden Shovel for hosting different guests and um, exposing different speakers from different walks of life and elements of professionalism to to all of your audience. I, I just am honored to be here today. Well, we're really glad to have you. And I just want to let uh, all the attendees that are here uh, listening in today know that uh, at any point during the presentation, you can type in questions over on the GoToWebinar control panel on the right side of the screen, and we'll be asking those questions at the end of the presentation. So feel free to put those in. Uh, just to uh, let everybody know, there will be a copy of the slides available uh, afterwards. So if uh, you don't need to uh, take too many notes, we'll be able to get those to you. You can contact uh, Victor Perez over at vperez at goldenshovel.com. And also, uh, there will also be a recording made, so if you need to share with uh, other people at your office. So without further ado, let's uh, kick it off, Lacey, and uh, we'll get back to the questions at the end. Okay, great. Thank you very much, and, and appreciate everybody who has taken the time to tune in this morning. I know how precious your time is, and, and certainly appreciate your uh, attention and interest in retail. Um, what is so interesting about retail as it's associated with economic development is that, you know, traditionally when you think of economic development, you don't necessarily think about retail. You know, that traditional thinking is that let's go after those high paying jobs, those industrial jobs. People will move to our town for those jobs and then the retail will follow the rooftop. So retail takes care of itself. Let's not put time and effort and energy into it. And that was a, an older way of thinking about retail as economic development. I would argue that today the exact opposite is true. It is so important today to focus on retail to build that vibrant community base that you need. Um, in the past, when people would look at jobs, they would try to find a job that they could stay in for 30 years or more and, and you know, pension plans and things along those lines were, were a very big deal. Well, today, when you look at millennials, they don't necessarily have that company loyalty. They're going to change jobs several times and even change careers. They're going to go where they're happy. And they tend to choose a place that they want to live first and then back into the job. Not always the case, but we're so spoiled as the younger generation of Gen Xs and Millennials that ideally we want to find both. So when you look at economic development and building a community, it is more important than it's ever been before to focus on retail and having the right restaurants and places to shop. That attracts your workforce, and then that workforce then attracts those high-paying jobs. I was blown away the first time I started getting in and really trying to understand retail to see what the economic impact of a retail retailer might be. Um, you know, an average McDonald's is going to do about $2.5 million in annual sales. So depending on what your sales tax collections are, and that's a, a large hit or investment in your, your budget, even something as small as a McDonald's. So when, when you're thinking about recruiting retail, of course, you want to go after the large outlet centers, the lifestyle centers, you know, the entertainment, things along those lines that are big shopping centers. But even something as small as a fast food restaurant can really um, have a positive impact on your sales tax collections and your jobs. You know, and on average, a fast food restaurant is going to employ more than 15 people. You know, grocery stores employ up to 300 people. And that's the same kind of win that you would see with, you know, a manufacturer in, in some cases. So uh, retail does matter. And I know that that thinking is, well, retail pays low, lower wages. So, you know, it, it has gotten ignored for that reason as well. Well, the National Retail Federation came out with a report that said, 
full-time retail job from the age 25 to 54 actually pay more than non-retail jobs. So when you look at all the wages across the board, it brings those averages down because a lot of retail jobs are part-time, they're seasonal, they're temporary, uh, they're entry-level positions things like that. But if you take those full-time jobs of experienced professionals age 25 to 54, uh, retail jobs actually pay more than non-retail jobs. So, so it's really worth taking a look at whenever you are, are building out your community plan, your economic de de development plan, where you want to have an impact, then retail is worth paying attention to. And then, of course, the quality of life. Um, you understand that. It's giving your local residents a place to shop, a place to eat. It's keeping those dollars locally and capturing those dollars so that they aren't leaving and going somewhere else to buy them or even going online to buy those items. You want to keep that dollar local. So it's, it's fascinating to know that about 12.7% of U.S. employment is made up of retail. Um, I'm sure if I were to poll everybody on the call, um, all of us have had an experience of an entry-level position that was somehow involved with retail. I worked at Pier 1 in college, and, and a lot of people have waited tables in getting through college. So those jobs are necessary. They do matter, and they're those entry-level positions that people need. Um, that have, you know, And then eventually they might move on to a more professional job, but it, it is about 12.7% of of all the jobs in the United States, and this is an ICSC um, statistic. So looking forward, once you understand that retail is a place where you want to make an investment for your community, then how do you, how do you work on it? How do you move forward? Um, now that knowing that the thinking and economic development and the importance of retail is different, then what's the next step? Well, today, more than I've ever seen in my experience is public-private partnerships matter. It is the new normal in retail development. Um, it's another way of looking at how do you, how do you build uh, retail and build shopping centers and build those restaurants and attract those entertainment zones. Um, in the past, uh, economic incentives were primarily just catered to industrial um, recruitment and industrial wins. Well, we're seeing more and more that those are impacting retail deals. And the reason is because during the recession, it was a huge challenge um, for retail growth across the board. I mean, when the stock market went down, then those retailers quit expanding. And now that the market has come back, what's happened is the cost of new construction has gone up. The cost of land has gone up. The cost of financing has gone up. All those things have gone up. But what the retailers are willing to pay has remained pretty similar. It has not risen to the same rate that the cost of development has risen. Therefore, when a developer is looking to do a new development, oftentimes there is a gap in their pro forma. And we hear it a lot when we're working with communities. Uh, we work with communities across the country, and we might find a, a lineup of retailers that want to be in that community. And we'll take it to a developer and say, let's do a new shopping center. And, and the developer will say, okay, the resellers can pay this in rent, but here's what it's going to cost to build it, and I'm coming in on the negative, or I'm not getting the amount of return I need for my investors in order to finance this project. So what's happened is the public sector has stepped in, and they've helped close that delta. So what they're doing is taking new dollars, new tax dollars that are generated by the project and applying them back to the project. So it's a very much a winning situation and it's not taking money from pot A and applying it to pot B. You're not taking away from the schools or law enforcement or anything like that in order to fund a shopping center that, you know, the common perception is, why am I going to give away taxpayers' dollars to make a wealthy developer wealthier? <laughs> and that's not what these incentives are for. These are incentives that the project would not happen if they did not exist, and it's the only way to get them off the ground. And it's important to think about retailers whenever they're expanding across the country. They might say, we want to open 40 new stores in the country this year, and that makes their investors happy. Uh, makes Wall Street happy. Okay, this retailer's growing. They're doing new stores. So they want to do 40 across the country. 
well, they still have to operate on a profit margin, and they're going to pick the most profitable locations, and they're going to try to keep that rent low. And and that's what's happening today is that they are doing um, their opening shopping centers where there is a public-private partnership and there is public participation. And that's what we're seeing in, as the new normal in retail development today, and especially in secondary and tertiary markets. So a lot of what Retail Strategies does as a company, and really the reason we even exist, we were established in 2011, and we branched out of a commercial real estate firm because we saw the municipalities really craving this desire of wanting to understand retail, not wanting to be taken advantage of, um, because in some cases, you shouldn't always incentivize a deal. <laughs> a lot of cases you do need to, but to what tend do you incentivize it that you're not getting taken advantage of? So, so we want to look at that and guide really the public sector in how to navigate the waters of commercial real estate in retail. And it's very complicated. There's a lot of different players and there's a lot of different pieces that have to come together. And um, bringing a professional to the table that understands this, has the contact and the knowledge, and understands just really the process of retail real estate is so important. And when we look at the communities that are very interested in growing their retail base, it makes a lot of sense to outsource it. And there's there's several different companies that do this, not just retail strategies, um, but one area where we have a unique model is that we very much focus on the real estate. But if a community were to try to do this themselves, the amount of research, data, um, the professional that you have to bring in with the right kind of context, it just really gets cost prohibitive when you look at that ROI. So it is a model that makes a lot of sense to outsource. And Retail Strategies works in 22 states, 128 communities, and we have an 88% retention rate. So I say that to say that this is, um, this is proven, that it works, the communities that we work with. And it really helps whenever you're, you're looking at a community and how do you implement your retail recruitment strategies. Um, so let's look at some trends that are moving forward. I'm going to pause for just a second. Can everybody still hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Okay, good. I received a message that the audio has paused, but um, if everybody can still hear, we're going to go ahead and move on. Um, looking at trends, let's, you know, really knowing from a macro perspective about what is happening in the country, it helps us on a micro perspective understand how to apply that to our community whenever we are trying to build out our own retail recruitment strategies. So, so let's look at those trends. What is happening big picture? Well, this is over the past several years, really the past decade. You can see the year over year um, same, same store sales with with retail and how there was a tremendous dip, as you know, during the Great Recession. That was a record low of negative 11.5 percent in December of 2008. Um, it has recovered. It has bounced back, which I think is very positive. In the last two years, we have seen a positive uptick in. And that is uh, just a very, you know, a good thing whenever you're looking at retail and what that means to real estate in the future. So, um, you know, when you think about why does it matter, same store sales year after year, your dollar places a vote. So when you're getting out there and you are spending money, you're telling the marketplace what you want. Um, and we told the marketplace during the recession that we want value and convenience. And the marketplace reacted to that. And a little bit later, we're going to talk about the different concepts that are expanding and contracting and more about our dollar and what it's telling the marketplace today. What I think is so positive is that consumer confidence is at a 13-year high. Another thing was during the recession, what happened was we ended up saving our money. So I'll majority of Americans were affected financially by the recession, but more than that, we were scared. So the impact on retail was tremendous. Um, and a lot of retailers quit their expansion and they closed stores. Well, consumer confidence says people feel good about the economy, they feel good about the future, and they're getting out there and they're buying stuff. And that's great. So that really drives our market, especially with uh, the real estate. So what's all the buzz? What is everybody studying right now? It's millennials 
and e-commerce. So let's talk a little bit about those two things, millennials and e-commerce. So who is a millennial? Now, different sources will categorize millennials differently. Um, this is just a sampling of, of a, a report that I found that I think is the best kind of gauge on millennials. What's so important to point out here is that there are more millennials than baby boomers. So that is a big deal when you think about them as a, a consumer group and their purchasing power. It's tremendous. And so that's why you see all these articles about millennials right now is that retailers are trying to figure out how to tap into the millennials' brain and how to capture their dollar. Um, baby boomers matter, but they're just, there's a lot of them, a lot of boomers. But when you look at boomers getting ready for retirement, what's unique about them is they already have purchased most of the soft goods that they want. They have all their furniture. They have all their clothes. They have everything, uh, for the most part, that they want and need. And so they're not spending as much of their disposable income on the type of things that really drive retail. A lot of their disposable income is going towards raising their grandkids, uh, going towards higher education for their kids, or it might be going to health care. And that's where their disposable income is going as opposed to retail. So that's why there's such a big focus right now on millennials. Now, I'll tell you, I find it interesting that Gen Xers are pretty much ignored. <laughs> you almost can't find an article out there about a Gen X. And, and that's me. <laughs> and I think we have a lot of purchasing power, but um, it's, they're really, we are not capturing any of the focus right now. So moving forward, let's look at the millennials. Who are they? They are driven by convenience. That is their number one driver is convenience. They're very tech savvy. It's incredibly important to have um, have anything that caters to millennials to be tech savvy. And they are all about experiences. They prefer experiences over products. So three and four millennials would choose to spend their money on an experience versus buying something desirable. So. Um, we see a lot of their money going towards electronics. Obviously, that is some, a place where they put a lot of money. Um, over half of them said they'd rather lose their sense of smell than their technology. So that's where they spend their money is on experiences and technology. But whenever it comes to, you know, having that huge home that they purchase, they're not so interested. They're not over-insured. <laughs> um, they'd rather have a smaller home, rather have IKEA furniture, and save their money to get out there and play and have life experiences. They'd rather rent than purchase for the most part. Now, I think that is a trend you will begin to see change as the older millennials are getting to the point where they're starting families. Um, one name that I saw for these older millennials was uh, Oregon Trail, because in school, a lot of the older millennials um, played Oregon Trail, and there's just a certain few years of a pocket of, of students that did that, and and they, um, the older millennials and the younger millennials do have a lot of differences in lifestyles, so at some point, you might see that group divided in half, but for now, that still is one big group, and they do care about experiences. And they want to shop online. And it's as, it's as much about convenience as anything else. They're going to shop from their tablet, um, shop from their phone. That's where they're making their purchases. So FOMO is a big word. And uh, I bet if I were to poll the audience, maybe about a quarter of you would know what FOMO is. This stands for fear of missing out. Uh, millennials live through their social media. So one great thing about their experience is that they can capture a picture of it and upload it to their social media. And this is the new form of popularity today. So FOMO is they just don't want to miss out on anything. So let's look at the, the retailers and understanding um, how technology and the millennials and how they're spending their money is impacting the retailers and their product. This is one example of a closing retailer Radio Shack. And this is an ad from 1991 with Radio Shack. And as you can see there, there's a, a computer, a phone, a radio, a recorder, all these items, um, and a video camera, speakers, all these items you can buy from Radio Shack. Well, back in 1991, if you were to buy all these products that are on this ad, about $3,000, and with inflation today, that would cost you almost $6,000 to buy all those products, and then you have to store them all over the place, right? 
Well, today, all those products are in your smartphone. Um, it's kind of the technology that the retail killer is apps. <laughs> and you can see how all those products have now uh, turned into a very easy, inexpensive, or free, um, free items that we have access to through our technology. And so if retailers don't adapt to this, they will be hurt. And it's going to hurt brick and mortar. It's going to hurt their sales. And they just really have to stay up on the trends with technology today. So that leads us to e-commerce. So let's look at e-commerce and, and that convenience of shopping online. I mean, you think about Black Friday, for instance, and, and how, you know, this year uh, Cyber Monday was huge, a record year for Cyber Monday. And when you have the option of the day after Thanksgiving waking up at 4 a.m. and going out in the freezing cold and waiting in lines and, and doing all that stuff to get that deal, or sitting on your couch by the fireplace on Cyber Monday and getting the same type of deal, you know, there's a, a sense of a convenience and comfort that comes with being able to shop online. And that's an extreme example that it's true across the board. So there was a bit of a fear initially when e-commerce was so big that, oh my goodness, e-commerce is going to kill brick and mortar forever. <laughs> well, not necessarily true. It's still only about 9% of retail sales. It's the fastest growing trend, but it is not going to take over brick and mortar. Brick and mortar is still alive and well. Um, look at Amazon. Amazon obviously dominates the marketplace, as you know, and there's a lot of legislation being discussed right now about how communities can capture sales tax dollars from Amazon. Um, and, and some states have figured it out, and right now it's a state-by-state -state, um, issue that ICSC is advocating for. ICSC is International Council of Shopping Centers, about 70,000 members um, in that organization, and it's the voice of, of retail real estate. And so it's something um, any community leaders that are on the line that are interested in how the loss of sales tax dollars through Amazon impacts your community, definitely look at that. It's called the Marketplace Fairness Act. And you can look that up and, and figure out how you can get involved. Now, Amazon is on board with this legislation. So um, I think that you will start to see that at some point within the next three to five years change where sales tax are captured at the time of purchase for online sales. Um, but you can see where they very much dominate the marketplace and then how it trends down from there. What I think is important to remember here is that retailers have to have both. You have to have a seamless integration between your brick and mortar store and your online stores. And that term is called omni-channeling, the big buzz term in our industry. So think about Starbucks, for instance. If you have the Starbucks app, it's awesome. You can load money on it. You can find your closest Starbucks. You can order your latte in advance and go pick it up, and it will be on the counter waiting for you. So great example of of being able to do all that on your phone, on your app, but then you still go into the brick and mortar location. I have a couple other examples here of Dunkin' Donuts and uh, Domino's. So there's multiple resellers that are doing this and really figuring it out and doing well. Because consumers still like to go into the store. They like to touch and fill. And what's so fascinating about um, you know consumers going into the store is the amount of time they spend but what's interesting and where we're seeing a shift is that a lot of that research is done, especially for big ticket items, there's a lot of research done online in advance. And then they go into the store and buy things. So what we're seeing is a much higher conversion rate for people. Typically when you go into the store, um, you know what you want. You know what you're looking for and you walk out with a product um, versus looking online. You might spend a lot of time looking online, but not actually ever purchase that item in your shopping cart. So conversion rate is much higher for in-store sales. And what the retailers are looking at now is how do they capture those returns? So where you, um, a lot of products are bought online, a lot of them are also returned because they didn't fit well or um, you don't like them. It's the difference in buying it in a store, that touch and fill um, moment. So you, you get it in um, in the mail, it's not what you expected, and you return it. So retailers are saying, okay, how do we get people to return it in our store because the likelihood of them returning it and then buying more is, is very good. And that's how they can maximize and capture additional dollars with that seamless integration between online and brick and mortar. So moving forward, 
what I think the important thing to look at is brick and mortar is not dead. E-commerce is huge. It's the fastest growing trend. It's not going away, but there still is retail expansion. Now, what this chart is, it's a little complicated, but basically what it's showing is that vacancy rates are very low. New construction is fairly low, and the absorption rate is very high. And this would imply that it's time for new development. And and we're, we've seen this over the past year, and I think we'll see more of it over the next two years. Uh, regardless of where you stand politically, um, with the new administration, there is a, a very positive undercurrent in the industry for new construction and where retail is going to be in the next couple of years. So that's very positive. Um, an interesting trend to look at is this is from ICFC, International Council of Shopping Centers, and you see that dark, um, the dark blue and the red. Uh, once again, getting back to that idea of, oh, my community wants an outlet mall. <laughs> you can see where, and and this uh, statistic's a little bit old. I haven't seen an updated chart um, in the last year, but there's probably more outlet malls than that now. But you can see the percentage of ratio of outlet malls versus just convenience centers, strip centers, neighborhood centers. And these are the places you go on a Tuesday coming home from work. It's the grocery anchored centers or it's the nail salon and the Chinese buffet. That's really where a lot of the shopping centers are, so they should not be ignored when you're looking at your growth plan. Um, I do think it's important to point out that there's almost 24 square feet of shopping center space per a person um, in the United States. Now, in countries like Europe, that number is closer to 2%. So we very much are heavy with shopping centers in the United States. Um, what we're seeing now is that retailers are demanding Class A um, space, and so some of that um, – some of that, those shopping centers that are on B and C class are going to really be challenged through um, in the coming years. So those are the trends that lead us to what we're looking at right now with expansion. So all of those, like I said before, your your dollars, your vote. Um, so the millennials, e-commerce, all of the way we're spending our dollars, our consumer confidence, it's all leading to um, different concepts and how they're growing. So where we're seeing retail growth are in things like fitness, health, spas, we're a healthier country. We're tired of our health care costs, and we're ready to take responsibility for our own health. We're tired of seeing friends and family sick. So you're seeing organic um, food and fitness centers and things along those lines. And, and in a lot of ways, health is a new form of luxury as a as an icon or a symbol for luxury. And so that's a you know that's one thing that is really driving the brick and mortar growth in that space. Uh, fast food, fast casual, a lot of growth there. I'm going to get more into that in a minute. Um, so dollar stores. I mentioned earlier that uh, the convenience and value is huge, and that is really driven the dollar stores and and their growth and. And Dollar General now is as much, or if not more, about convenience than it is about um, about value. It is an 8,000 square foot Dollar General that you can pop, in, or Dollar Tree, or even Family Dollar, that you can pop in and out of real quick, as opposed to maybe a Walmart Supercenter might be 187,000 square feet, and you have to park way out in the parking lot and walk all the way back to the back right corner to get your milk. And, you know, if you're anything like me, you pick up 15 other items before you check out and uh, 15 cash registers and only one of them's open, right? So 20 minutes later, I'm in my car with my gallon of milk and a bunch of products I don't need. And, you know, it's just uh, it's, it's, uh, frustrating and time-consuming and all those things. And so the dollar stores are really competing with that concept. And and um, doing a very good job of it. It's been very effective, really. Um, when you look at pet stores, that is something that was proven to be recession resistant. We love to spoil our pets. Now, where you're seeing closures are, are things, some of those that we hit earlier, electronics, books, um, really office supplies, things like that are really um, challenged right now in closing. And important to point out, the casual dining concepts are also closing. So looking at casual dining, that's your you nice know, sit-down steakhouses, right? Um, and, and a lot of this is driven by the millennials. They would much rather have a cool experience at a 
um, a local hole in the wall or chef driven concept or something like that rather than going to a, a generic, as they would call it, a generic um, uh, casual dining location. It's not nearly as fun to take a picture of your quesadilla explosion from Chili's and upload it to Instagram as it would be to go to the a food truck on the corner and get a ten dollar hot dog and and upload that. I mean that's more fun for the millennials and it's really impacted casual dining. So um, a lot of communities we work with they want a nice sit down steakhouse. They want that. Um, it's just really hard to find national brands that are expanding within that category. So it's really more about local. Uh, so across the board. Last year, there were about 42,000 new concepts to open among restaurants and, and retailers, and about half of those were in the restaurant category. So that's really the place to focus, and you can see a huge amount of dollar stores as well. Um, when you're looking at restaurants, one of the driving factors is that we, as of March 2016, we as consumers now go to restaurants more than we eat at home. So we're eating away from home more than in home, and it's really driving out those restaurant sales. It's the, you know, the dual income type housing, and it's just um, our household. And really, it's about time and convenience. And um, restaurants are good, and fast casuals are great, and people can quickly pick up something on their way home and and feed the whole family and have a great experience without all the, um, you know, the sweat equity I guess that goes into. Uh, buying groceries and cooking a meal and things along those lines. So we're eating out a lot more. It's really driving that restaurant growth. Here's a few uh, fast casual concepts that are really growing right now. And fast casual is that idea where you go up and you order your food and you sit down and you don't necessarily have to, um, you don't have wait staff or so you don't have to leave an extra tip. You're getting good quality food at a little bit lower price point and you control your time. If you want to be in there for 10 minutes or two hours, that is on you and that's a little bit different than a casual dining restaurant where you aren't necessarily in control of your time and that's we're so we're seeing a huge growth in fast casual also seeing a lot of growth in the qsrs which are quick service restaurants so tremendous growth in that space and these are just a few of the concepts that have announced aggressive uh, expansion plans we're seeing a lot with uh, chicken pizza and burgers so those are the categories of growth right now um, switching over to the dollar stores that I kind of hit on earlier, I think this is fascinating that every five hours in America, a new dollar store opens. And Dollar General did mention that they're going to do another, I think, a thousand stores this year. So at some point, these dollar stores are going to hit a level of saturation. I don't know when that will be or what happens when they do, but for now, they are continuing to very aggressively grow. If you're interested in more of these trends, um, please tune in to Retail Strategies webinars. Every month we have different um, categories that we focus on, and we we host different uh, real estate professionals to tell us a little, a little bit more in detail about their specific um, categories. So next week, for instance, we have a, a real estate director from Kroger Grocery Stores that's going to talk, and then uh, the following month in March, we're going to focus on fast casual and have a couple speakers there. So if these are um, topics of interest to you, just go to the Retail Strategies website and look at our webinars and feel free to tune in. And those are uh, free webinars, very similar to what Golden Shovel does. And, and once again, I applaud Golden Shovel for putting these webinars together because definitely the more we know, the more empowered we are across the board as uh, industry and as community leaders. So with all that being said, what's next? What are we looking at? Well, in today's age, a lot of what we're trying to figure out is big data. Okay, so how do you become effective in recruiting retail to your community now that you know that you want retail, you know what is driving the trends, and now you know who's expanding? Then how do you get them to the community? And in the world of big data, you can see this is Where's Waldo. Uh, the big question is, who is my consumer and how do I capture their dollar? And when I first started in this industry, um, it was just amazing to get any kind of data at all. We, I would go get a street map from the Chamber of Commerce and I would get a, a welcome package and it'd be full of uh, brochures on the town festival and, and you know, some local merchants and things along those lines. Um, and it was just a real challenge to figure out who that consumer actually was. Well, today we're in an era of information overload. 
where we have so much information. So the question is, how do you narrow it down to a usable uh, a source so that we can be effective? Retailers are getting better and better at this, and, and this gets back to what I mentioned earlier, why I think it's so important for communities to hire a consultant to work with them in the retail space is because it's incredibly sophisticated, and at the end of the day, most retailers want about three or four bullet points of information, and every single retailer has a different three or four bullet points of information that they want and need. Uh, so the big key is knowing what that retailer is looking for and then how to use all this big data to get it back to them in a very succinct um, manner. Uh, the less is more is definitely a term within our industry. It needs to be just very limited information, but it needs to be exactly what they're looking for. Um, no fluff, no time wasters, let's get down to it. So one of the things that we've incorporated that is really an industry, um, a lot of the industry leaders are using is it's mobile tracking data. And it's a really cool, cool thing. It's also a little bit scary, but if your location services are on on your phone, we can track that and we purchase that information so we can um, identify a retail node and see within the last six months where the people live that shopped within that retail node and then that helps us identify a customized trade area and we say okay here's here's where people live that are shopping at this location and then from there we can take the psychographics it's um it's basically a, a shorthand for demographics and we can define the personality of those people and then we can match that up with the retailers that are looking for that type of consumer so it's a it's a pretty fun little process that we go through with that big data and what if what we are finding more and more in our partnerships and the feedback we get from the brokers retailers and developers is okay, this is awesome, now we have all this data, what's the local story? They want to know what that story is that you understand as a community leader, you understand how those, those uh, driving patterns, where people are um, driving home from work, driving to school, dropping their kids off, if, they're, if you're Dunkin' Donuts or Starbucks, you want to be on the AM side of the road, the going to work side of the road, if you're a grocery store, you want to be on the PM side of the road, if people are driving home from work and what they can get home before their ice cream melts type of scenario. So there's that local story about your major employers and, and what matters to people. Are, are these salt of the earth type people that are very community minded and civic leaders and drive pickup trucks and listen to country music? Or are they trendsetters that are um, very quick to adapt new technology and, and constantly on the move and spending all their money on insurance and experiences versus product. I mean, that's the type of thing psychographics can tell us. And and um, and then you can put the local story with that. And, and that's what the retailers are looking for. So public-private partnerships are so important today, and it's just going to be growing in their importance. And it's, it's telling the story, it's knowing the local information, and then it's really figuring out how to apply all that and eventually it might even lead to some level of a financial incentive that's needed um, in order to make a project happen that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So P3 is public-private partnerships, incredibly important in retail. I wanted to show a sampling of a lot of the shopping centers that we are seeing today. Uh, in the past, Walmart or Target would expand and all the usual suspects would line up behind them. Well, today it's a little bit different in that you see some sort of combination here of some of these retailers. So it's either a grocery anchored center, those are the logos that you see on the left. These are some of the grocery stores that are opening and anchoring those centers. Or it's a combination of one of them on the right. So, you know, you get a craft user, a pet user, a sports user, a shoe, and an apparel. And TJ Maxx and Ross will locate in the same shopping center, but a lot of these others will exclude each other. So it's some sort of combination of them as the anchors. And you'll get a handful of these, uh, what we call junior anchors. And that is enough to create the retail, retail synergy to build the shopping center. And then you'll build out shop space and out parcels. And, and then you, before you know it, you have anywhere from 100 to 200,000 square foot shopping center. And that's in um, secondary and tertiary markets. That's what we're seeing the growth in. What a lot of what we're looking at right now for the future is 
how is Wall Street driving this, and what does that mean to us? Um, now you see, this is a last year was a record year for mergers and acquisitions across the board, and that's definitely that is trending true this year as well for retail. So you can you can see that there's a lot of pressure from investors on Wall Street to to have profit. And what it's doing is it's causing a lot of the retailers to make short-term decisions that might not actually be the best play for them long-term. Um, so that is something we are definitely watching is, is what's going to happen with Wall Street as investors put pressure on these publicly traded retailers, and then how is that going to impact their real estate decisions. Um, so those are some of the changes ahead, and especially with the new administration. And then eventually we're going to have flying cars, right? And so flying cars are absolutely going to change this entire industry and everything that we're doing. So another way of looking at that, and that is very much in the future, but very realistic to think that it will be in our lifetime and we'll look back on this webinar today and be laughing. So it's important to know where we've been, where we are, and, and where we're headed when we're looking overall at and how to build vibrant communities and predict where we might be going in the future and where to invest our time and resources. Uh, so with that, I'd be more than happy to entertain any questions that you might have. All right, that sounds great. Wow, that was uh, absolutely fascinating, Lacey. What an interesting presentation, um, just seeing how things are changing today. Um, there are some uh, good questions that have been asked, and. Uh, there have been a couple around rural communities, and I really liked this one. It said, I live in the least populated state in Wyoming. Many towns are an hour apart from each other. Many retailers say they need a certain population base within five miles. Many of us do not have this. How can we bring in retailer restaurants when this is hard to obtain, especially in rural areas? She noted uh, we get about 15,000 to 20,000 cars, trucks a day that go by. The town is only 10,000. Mm hmm Gosh, such a great question, and that is definitely the million-dollar question that um, we we get often. And and it, it you know what's tough about real estate is the answer almost always is it depends. But I'll give in my um, in my experience some kind of best practices. And what you already understand is that retailers want to be profitable, and they all build out this model, and they say, okay. Within a five mile radius, and that's why they care about radius rings and drive times versus um, municipal boundaries is because municipal boundaries vary and all they care about is their location in proximity to those rooftops. So they'll say in five mile radius ring or 10 minute drive time, I need X population. Well, a lot of times that's just a beginning kind of rule of thumb that they're going to be looking at. They are willing to dive in a little bit deeper with a few different variables. Um, the number one thing that we find that impacts or will raise their eyebrows or change their mind um, if the population is light is if you can prove that the other existing stores that are locating there are doing above average sales volume. So if you're trying to recruit a certain restaurant, what you want to do is look at every other restaurant that's already in the city and what their annual sales volumes are. And if you can show that those annual sales volumes are above average for that retailer, then that is something, that's a great story to tell. Um, in Retail Strategies website, there's a link that says resources. And within that, there's a variety of different retailers and restaurants and what their average annual sales volumes are. So feel free to use that free uh, resource to you on the Retail Strategies website. So you can look at it and say, okay, if I know if an average McDonald's is two and a half million and mine's doing four million, then you want to tell people that and it'll make those other uh, restaurants say, okay, well, there's more market share here I want to capture. But it's also important when you think about the shop local campaigns. We talked a lot about, um, about e-commerce and, you know, a, a purchase on Amazon is a purchase that's not counted in your local brick and mortar. And it's important to, to recognize that retailers are looking at other retailers and their sales. So shop local isn't only about shopping mom and pop stores. It's also shopping those national chains that exist there. So that's important to look at. Okay, so first is uh, retailer sales volumes. And then two, you mentioned traffic counts. And, and I do think that matters a lot. If you have a light population but you can prove a heavy traffic count, then that's a great story to tell, and you certainly want to share that. Um, and then 
beyond that, you know, any kind of future plans that are happening, if you have a new um, a new major employer, a school, or anything of that nature, one thing I would warn against that I see a lot of communities do, and, and it's understandable, um, they wouldn't know unless somebody told them, but often when you're giving your industrial sales pitch, you want to promote a new bypass, right? We're, we're getting this new bypass, it's great. Think about it from a retailer's perspective. Bypasses are not that great. What it means is you're dividing the traffic count in half and giving them half as much exposure. And so don't necessarily come out of the gate with your leading sales pitch about your new bypass uh, to a retailer. So keep keep that in mind as well. Um, it's important to know that these retailers are constantly changing their criteria for profitability. And so, uh, and who's expanding and when they're expanding and things along those lines. So, uh, Restaurant News, if you're interested in restaurants, restaurantnews.com is a great source and every single day they send me a newsletter with about nine different articles of different restaurants and what's happening with them. So, um, this week, for instance, uh, Burger King's parent company bought out Popeyes. Uh, that's something to look at and be aware of because um, it might change your real estate locally. Uh, so staying up on those trends is, is a big thing that you might say, okay, well, I reached out to to Popeyes, you know, three years ago, and they said no. Well, try it again. <laughs> Something's new there. And uh, I would say it is important to identify maybe 10 different retailers that you most want in your community and really know everything there is to know about them and focus on them and when you reach out to them prove that you've done your homework on them so that you are not wasting anybody's time and that you might get a response from that retailer that you're reaching out to. Um, a program that Retail Strategies has is called Retail Academy and it caters to towns with less than 10,000 in population and the goal of Retail Academy is uh, to bring individuals and community leaders into our office and sit down with them for two days and talk about the real estate, talk about the retail prospects that we think are a good fit for their market, the type of real estate they want, and then the customized sales pitch for those retailers, and then what's happening with those retailers in today's marketplace. And, and that's been in a very effective program because about 85% of the municipalities across the country have a population of less than 10,000, and retail is economic development for rural America. I understand that, completely understand that. So the more educated we can be as rural America on retail, who's expanding and what they require, then, you know, the more impactful we can be. Um, to the same tune, I'm working very hard to talk to the private sector, the real estate managers and these retailers, and encouraging them to lean on the local community to understand that local story beyond the demographics. And that's a little bit more of a challenge, but we as a company at Retail Strategies are really encouraging the private sector to lean on the public sector for information because they might be missing something. Um, the the movie's um, founder that's about McDonald's is just incredible. A great story. If you haven't seen it, then then I would hi highly encourage it. And a good story about how a restaurant can do so well in rural America. And I hope that uh, more restaurants are paying attention to that and focusing on it. That's great. Um, another good question. Um, is there a retail organization or trade organization where communities can go and meet in, a, in that kind of environment, a conference environment, and uh, set up appointments uh, with retailers? Yes. Absolutely. I'm so glad you asked, and I, I should have mentioned it earlier. It's ICSC, International Council of Shopping Centers. The uh, good news is for the public sector, memberships only $100 a year. They have an entire um, program line that's called P3 retail that caters to public-private partnerships, um, but they have conferences across the country that have retailers, brokers, and developers at those shows. So I would highly encourage looking into your, um, first of all, just becoming a member of ICSC, an incredible bang for your buck, and then looking at your local leadership within ICSC. Each state 
have a different board or or just email me directly. I'm I'm more than happy to connect you with them. I'm I'm heavily involved with ICSC myself and know most of that network. So I'd be happy to get you plugged in with the right people to learn more about ICSC and how you can attend some of these conferences. Um, our company attends about 22 ICSC conferences a year, and we do find that to be a, a great um, avenue to uh, get face to face with the retailers. Great. Um, there's a there's a few more questions. They're coming in a little quicker now, so there's a lot of uh, interest in what okay. you're sharing. I'll shorten up my uh, one, answers then. <laughs> oh, no problem. Uh, one of the questions is yeah. that in Virginia they cannot collect sales receipts data because the information is private. How do they determine sales volume without getting sales tax receipt data? Woo! That is a great question. It's probably the hardest information to obtain, and. Uh, you can sometimes find out by talking to the local manager, and you don't have to have the exact number. I think just something within a range or figure out where they rank regionally. You know, okay, within this region, how how well does your store do comparative to the other stores? And, you know, store managers love to brag on their success. Um, so that is just local information that is very hard to find, and and that's where you really can add a lot of value if you can get a hold of it. I'll tell you, an average uh, Walmart typically does about $426 per square foot in sales. Um, now, Walmarts are all different sizes, but about $68 million would be an average Walmart. That's what they're going to want to know probably is Walmart, Lowe's, um, some of those big box retailers. And then, you know, most of your restaurants are probably going to, should be around a million dollars a year. Uh, fast food restaurants, McDonald's does a little bit better than that. So like I said, some of those are on our website. Um, but how to obtain them, if you can, it's great. But uh, don't put too much pressure on yourself to get the exact number. If you can at least just get it within a range and be able to tell that story, that's great. Excellent. Uh, here's another question that came in. Um, we're a rural community considering a GAP study to determine what types of products and services people are shopping elsewhere for that could be sustained in our community see if there's enough demand. Do you have any input or, or advice for this process? Absolutely, I do. Um, that is something we do focus on at Retail Strategies and with Retail Academy as well is our what we call the gap analysis or leakage report. Um, I do think it's important to identify the categories where the goods and services are leaving the market. Um, that can be very complicated information and it can be misconstrued very easily. So I would definitely um, recommend hiring a professional or finding somebody who can help you understand it. We do it within the customized trade area. I mentioned earlier about the mobile tracking data. Then we identify the customized trade area and then we figure out the goods and services that are leaving. Um, somebody like a fast food restaurant, for instance, you know, they might care about a three-mile radius ring where a Walmart might care about a 20-minute drive time. So the the different categories and their trade area that you want to analyze those statistics from vary, and, and that's where it gets complicated. I'd also say there's particular categories where you actually, a surplus is good. So soft goods, apparel, for instance, there's retail synergy there that you know, they want to um, co be co-tenants with each other. And so, you know, in some categories, retail synergy, the surplus matters. In other categories, the gap matters. <laughs> so it can be very complicated, but I would just say that it makes a lot of, I think those are, that could be good information, but it can also uh, be easily misread or misconstrued if you don't have somebody helping you who really understands the industry and what you're looking at. Yeah, fair enough. Sounds like a good reason to give you guys a call. I have uh, <laughs> another good question here. Um, you mentioned that millennials tend to value experiences more than products and that this has driven growth in local small restaurants. Does that also apply to boutique local stores versus brand name retailers? And I'd like to expand the question to ask also, how does that uh, affect the specialty stores versus these changing business models. And I'm thinking of like Walgreens and CVS where they're sw switching from very specifics to offering groceries and, and that type of piece. Um, do, specialty pro do specialty stores have a, along with a boutique local stores, have a competitive advantage? 
Yes, um, yes, and I I think what we're seeing is that the the national brands are trying to incorporate local products. So if you take Whole Foods, for instance, um, a lot of Whole Foods, they, they've carved out a segment of their store to bring in a, a local merchant. And in some cases, even um, a tattoo parlor, things along that, along those lines, like in the Whole Foods. So um, it's sort of that combination. I think that millennials do want, they want to feel good about their purchase and they're a little bit more philanthropic about um, wanting to make sure they're willing to spend a little bit more to know that their purchase is going to the good of humanity. So um, they want to purchase Toms, right, and, and things like that. So I do think it helps the um, the local merchants. But what I would say um, about that experience is they're not if it's too inconvenient or too expensive that breaks the model. So they prefer local because it feels more authentic that it has to be in line with the convenience and price point of the national. Did that answer the question? I, yep, okay. yep, I believe so. Um, how about on the specialty stores? Uh, where these stores uh, are, they seem like they're becoming more and more convenience stores uh, versus uh, uh, specializing in one one area that seems contradictory in some ways to the specialist uh, mentality of the millennials. Uh, uh, so an example of that, let's see. So you're saying that, um, I'm sorry, we asked the question um, again. I'm not sure I fully understand it. Certainly, certainly. Why are groups like, like the Walgreens and the CVSs changing into grocery models where they instead of being a pharmacy and just a makeup and that type of thing is becoming, um, you, know, you can buy milk there now and wine. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. I think that, that definitely just goes back to that convenience, um, that convenience factor and how the dollar stores, for instance, are, are doing just, you know, they're serving, gro they have groceries as well. So people can pop in and grab what they need and, and go on. Um, this is probably catering a little bit less to the millennials and probably more of the Gen Xers and boomers that that kind of the the pharmacies having everything. Um, it just goes to pace and speed. Sure, that makes sense. Lacey, thanks so much for joining us today and giving this presentation. It was uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, once again, for all the people that are attending today, thanks for taking the time. And if you'd like copies of the slides or a recording of the uh, presentation, we can make that available to you. Please contact us. Uh, you can contact Victor at V-P-E-R-E-Z at goldenshovel.com, and we'll put something on our website, too. And uh, Lacey, Thank uh, you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure, and congratulations to Golden Shovel and all the great work that you do. So thank you very much. Thank you. Take care, everybody. See you next month.